Um, today we have Toto Gronland, um, Gronland, sorry, advisor for the James Lind Alliance, and Caroline Whiting, who's research manager for the James Lind Alliance. Could you describe the process for the James Lind Alliance ME CFS Priority Setting Partnership? What's really important is actually why um, ME CFS uh, Partnership has actually chosen um, the James Lind Alliance approach. And, and it's because with the James Lind Alliance, what we're trying to do is just set a slightly different research agenda. Because what normally happens in kind of medical research, health research, is that the kind of research priorities and research agendas, they're usually set by the big pharmaceutical companies or the research funders or, in fact, researchers themselves. Um, and quite often, there's a mismatch between what gets researched and what actually matters to people who are living with the condition. So James Lind Alliance has always tried to step in and let kind of people who live with the condition, patients, their family, carers, as well as the frontline kind of clinicians who work with those patients to get involved and, and set a slightly different research agenda of the sorts of questions that matter to them um, uh, in, in terms of what their lived experience is. And, and the sort of principles that are really important in the JLA approach are, are about inclusiveness. You know, we try to make sure that we have patients, carers and clinicians together, working together, but all of them with equal voice. Uh, and that's really, really important. And, and the process is transparent. You know, everything is documented and available and open to scrutiny. And decisions are made just within the resources that are available to that particular partnership to, to progress the work. Um, and the other principle that we always have as well is, is that we're very evidence-based. We have a high standard of evidence so that um, if we want to see if research has already been done in an area, we expect it to be of a very, very high standard before we would claim any questions been actually answered. The process itself is actually quite simple. Um, it, uh, it's um, fundamental to the process is actually the people, the steering group, uh, which is made up of usually of equal numbers of people with lived experience of patients, as well as the clinicians who look after them. And the process is simply first to consult with as wide a range of people as possible. Again, of the same type, you know, people with lived experience, patients, carers and clinicians to consult with these people and to ask them, what is it that matters to them? What would they like to see researched? And through that process, which is often done online, um, even in non-COVID times, we do that online to reach as wide a range of people as possible. Um, we gather possibly hundreds and hundreds of questions that people think are important to them. The next stage is to actually try and comprehend what those questions are asking, try and interpret them, comprehend them, and to summarize them, because obviously hundreds of questions is too much for anybody to cope with. And from that, we go on to the next stage, once we've summarized that information, is to consult again with the same sort of wide range of people, again, usually using online methods, um, and to consult with them actually to try and get a sense of the priorities of those questions that we've summarized. So what in those questions would be their priorities? So we're trying to get a kind of a short list of priorities uh, that people think would be important for research to answer. And once we've done this, and this has all been done by individuals, uh, just from their own hearts, from their own minds, their own priorities, their own thinking, um, the final stage of the process is having a consensus workshop where we choose the top 10 priorities through a kind of a consensus, consensus kind of method of discussion and actually listening to each other's views. And again, the same principles apply, transparency, equal voice, and uh, being as evidence-based as possible. So what is the role of the patient care and clinician representatives on the actual steering group? They're absolutely fundamental. They, they're the heart of the whole process. They're the heart of a uh, priority setting partnership. Uh, they're the experts. Uh, they all have expertise. They have lived experience. They've got the knowledge. They've also got the networks, quite often the networks to connect to other people so that we can uh, you know, have as wide a consultation as possible. So that's, that's it. You know, we, we couldn't do it without them. How are you getting the survey out to people with ME and how are you um, including people with severe ME, those that the 25% that are actually you know, bed bound most of the time? How are you trying to reach those people? 
we're working closely with the steering group. Um, so they're able to use their experience to put together a, a plan to make sure that the uh, as wide a range as possible of people with experience of MECFS actually see the survey. So they have put together a plan of how to communicate with groups, individuals, um, carers, health professionals using those networks, using um, charities and support groups um, to help communicate the, the survey. So they'll be using uh, all sorts of publicity, including social media, emails, other forms of more direct contact with people um, through the partners that are supporting the, the work, all the different organisations that they've already spoken to about this. Um, while the survey is open, I'll report each week to back to the steering group to tell them about the types of people who are responding to it. So we'll be collecting some basic information such as how old people are, um, what the severity of MECFS is that they've experienced, or if they're a health professional, what kind of health professional they are. Um, and in that way, the steering group um, and Toto and I together can all look at the types of people who are responding and importantly, who's not responding so that they can then take steps to communicate better with those groups of people and um, increase the responses from them. Um, so um, as Toto said, this is predominantly done online, but there will be paper copies of the survey available from um, the website or just by phoning up and, and requesting a paper copy. So we'll have that available as well. So once you've got all your results from the survey, how do you make sure the priorities identified are used by the research funding organisations? There have now been over 100 James Lind Alliance priority setting partnerships in different health areas over the years. So there are many examples of how identified priorities have been used to influence the research that happens. Um, and the JLA priority setting process is, is well respected by researchers and funders. So they, they will take notice of the, the priorities that have come out of this. Once the priority areas for MECFS research have been agreed by the community, the, the steering group will help communicate those priority areas to researchers and funders. So they'll, they'll publish um, different kinds of reports. Um, the priorities will be published on the James Lind Alliance website as well. Um, and there's usually some work to be done to help researchers and funders identify what's really important um, and what the specific research questions are that will help to address those priority areas. And that's something that the steering group can continue to help with as well over, over a period of time, because they've had the experience of going through the process and they've seen what's really important to those people who answered the survey. So um, it's it's great that they're involved in helping researchers and funders make sure that the, the questions that they fund or research are the ones that people were really concerned about. What can the ME community do to help the survey? We would love the ME community out there to, to get involved. Um, the partnership is so keen to hear from absolutely everybody from all corners uh, and with all sorts of issues and considerate, you know, concerns about MECFS. So, yeah, please publicise, please participate. Um, there's no kind of questions that are too daft. There's no ideas that are silly. Um, we're really keen to hear from everybody and lots and lots of different perspectives. That's what makes this process so valuable. A big welcome here to the members of the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership Steering Group. Um, I'll be talking to them in a minute, but uh, just a brief introduction to the work they're doing on the steering group. Um, the Priority Setting Partnership uh, brings together clinicians, patients and carers to work together to identify and prioritise questions which can be answered, which cannot be answered by existing research. Um, some of you will have already seen the survey that we issued in, in April um, and the steering group will take the results of the survey and identify the top 10 research priorities uh, for MECFS. The results of the survey and the, the top 10 priorities from the survey will be used by the James Lind Alliance to um, go to researchers and research funding bodies um, and encourage research in those areas. Uh, 
Um, so I was really, really interested in the ideas behind the steering group. So I volunteered uh, for the steering group and um, was able to get on it. So the reasons are, I, firstly, I have ME. Um, I had meningitis when I was 33 years old and I'm now 66, so that's 33 years ago. Um, secondly, I was a GP, so I kind of um, am aware of how research went from that side. And then thirdly is a very personal one for me, which is that 11 years ago, I started taking a drug called low-dose naltrexone. Um, which for me transformed my life. Now, I know for some people it doesn't work at all and some people it only works partially. But for me, from being really housebound in a wheelchair, I was back to virtually normal. And I have spent the last 11 years trying to find someone who would conduct a clinical trial on it. And it was a deeply frustrating 11 years because of the way that research in this country is absolutely dependent on finding someone who is senior enough to be able to put in funding applications to get that research done. Uh, when I saw that they were establishing the um, priority setting partnership, I realised straight away that I hopefully would want to offer my services to help. Um, I personally am a doctor, a consultant who's had to give up work because of the condition. Um, and have subsequently realised and learnt that good quality research into ME has sadly been neglected, uh, woefully underfunded, um, particularly when you bear in mind the disease burden of the condition um, and the opportunity to play a small part in changing that to try and engage the wider ME community as well as engaging new uh, talented researchers who perhaps haven't engaged in the area before, uh, the possibility of being able to develop some questions that would spark their interest, engage them, um, and sort of widen the pool of talented researchers working on the condition was, um, was one I certainly didn't want to uh, pass up on. Um, hence wanting to become involved with the process. Um, and when I realised I might have some skills that could help, wanted to be part of the steering group as well. Um, I wanted to get involved because I see this um, as an absolutely uh, essential, incredibly important gateway to potentially starting the research, medical research into ME goes, um, as, as Ben has mentioned, it's been woefully inadequate. It's been so underfunded. And my personal motivation is as the mother of a young woman with very severe ME, she's been ill nearly eight years now. I, I, I can't believe it actually. She's 100% bed bound, she's tube fed, and she's been like that for several years now. And I really truly believe the only way out for her is more research so we just understand what is going on with this confounding illness so that's that was a very personal motivation and I, I I've not worked in the area of medicine professionally but I work with a lot of disabled people and in an educational role so I, I just felt that I could bring that understanding as well to my role. I heard about the James Lynn Alliance uh, before and the work that they've done around priority setting partnerships uh, over the years uh, and been aware that this was a potential way of getting more research funding into ME uh, and, and prioritising the views of patients, carers and clinicians. So, uh, so I was aware of it beforehand and then the opportunity came up to join the steering group and that felt like a role that I had, you know, uh, various experience that would be relevant for. I myself lived with severe ME for a number of years um, and I'm lucky to be uh, significantly better at the moment um, but it felt like my experience of that enabled me to both speak to the views of people with severe ME um, and uh, but also participate in the steering group where I'm aware that you know uh, when I had severe ME this is not something that I would have been able to do so uh, it feels like an exciting opportunity to uh, put the views of patients, care and clinicians first.
uh, in a research field that has often been dominated by um, other, other voices? Well, I knew of the James Lind Alliance um, from my research, my work as an academic, um, and I, I'd been involved in priority setting exercises for the areas that I'm active in research in stroke rehabilitation and neurological rehabilitation. Um, and I know that they have a lot of influence when it comes to um, influencing, influencing research agendas. If you have a, if you're looking at a topic that, and you can say this is a priority that's come from the James Lind Alliance that is important to um, people with the condition, people who care for them, uh, and professionals who are working with them, then that has a lot of clout. So I've always been a supporter of the James Lind Alliance, um, and as I said, been involved with other other topics. Uh, so when I saw this was coming up for people with ME, um, as somebody who has ME and is a carer for somebody with ME as well, I felt A, it was a really important topic um, and important to, obviously with the, if you like, the political situation with ME and CSF, having um, patients and carers voices heard is really important. I mean, it's important in any condition, but it's there's an extra element of it um, for MACSF. Um, and I felt I had um, a contribution I could make as, as a clinician, as a physiotherapist, an academic person with ME and a carer. I kind of felt that I had a, um, I had a foot in many camps and um, also, my, my research is into a clinical applied research, um, which obviously is a particularly thorny issue for MECSF. So I, I hope to um, bring uh, make what might be considered an, an alternative voice or maybe a sensible voice of applied uh, clinical research to the, to the topic. Um, so uh, the experience uh, I bring uh, is sort of twofold. Um, the first is experience of the condition. Um, I have been out of work uh, now uh, for three or four years, uh, completely unable to um, to function as I did uh, because of the condition. Um, and... I have experience uh, and skills and training from my previous job that um, hopefully can really contribute and help uh, the process. Um, before becoming ill, uh, suddenly um, I was a consultant paediatrician um, specialising in neurodisability and was also clinical director of, of my department. Um, and through training and experience, um, I have learned about how to use evidence-based medicine, um, as well as how to design, uh, put in place and run and take part in a number of research studies, um, at qualitative and quantitative, um, as well as being trained in science communication. So hopefully, I think one of the great frustrations of this condition is that I've got all these years of training and experience, which sadly um, I'm no longer able to uh, use as I did uh, to treat and help patients. So the opportunity to do something like this, where I can use those skills um, again uh, for a purpose to, uh, to help people is one that, uh, one that I'm you know, excited to bring to the process. Um, the experience that I bring to the steering group is very much personal experience as a mother and as a carer. So my daughter was a teenager when she first became ill. I have experience of how one of the major current NHS recommended treatments made my daughter much, much more ill. Um, I have experience of some approaches which also made my daughter very much more ill so I've got that experience I've got experience of how the NHS deals with this illness so from you know from sympathetic treatment to downright dreadful and appalling 
um, you know, at all at all levels of, of medicine. And I've battled and I've fought and I've argued and I've, you know, it, it's been a long, long story. So I think it's a, it's, it's a personal story. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's the sort of on the personal front, you know, I'm very, very motivated for the future of, of my daughter and everybody else who suffers along with her with this condition. And then on my professional side, because I work within education, within the arts, um, I've, I've long worked with um, disabled people. So I've been very much involved with disability rights um, as, as an able-bodied ally and supporter. So I think all those things sort of come together and, and what I can offer to the steering group. Um, the experience I bring to the PSB steering group is firstly that I have ME. I experienced very severe ME at the start. I still have a memory of lying in bed, being unable to pick up a glass of water while I was getting more and more thirsty. Um, it's this terrifying feeling of just not understanding why you can't do anything, but you can't do anything. Um, but I've also experienced all the other levels of severity. So I've been moderate, I've been mild. I live a fairly normal life now. Uh, secondly, I was a GP. Thirdly, when I was um, able to get back to work for a short time before I was retired finally, I worked in a haemophilia unit, he, sorry, haemophilia unit. Um, on a very part-time basis. But one of the things that they were doing was they were doing clinical trials of new treatments for bleeding in haemophiliacs. Now that's a very easy clinical trial. You've got a defined patient group, you've got a problem that they bleed and you want to make it better. And so the kind of clinical trial way it runs through is very easy, very, very expensive, but I was, very involved in how it was done and understand the kind of regulations, how, how meticulous you've got to be when you run clinical trials and all that is actually very important, but it increases costs. Um, the fourth thing I bring is that because I was trying to find a way of getting the drug that I take um, through clinical trials, I actually, eventually I went back to university and did um, a master's in research to understand how you do clinical trials and how how research is run and that actually taught me an incredible amount um, about a whole system of research in the UK um, and finally again because of my interest in the drug that I take um, I've kept up to date as much as possible with research in ME. So I've got a kind of, I've been going to CMRC um, conferences since they were set up. I go to the Invest in ME. I've even been to the Invest in ME Colloquium, which is a, a, an amazing group of researchers from all over the world that are discussing um, ME. So um, I think I'm very fortunate in what I've been able to do during the past 11 years, apart from this frustration I just can't get a clinical trial going. I found it useful, I think, to have that perspective of having been involved with, with other priority setting exercises. But I I've, haven't been involved in the steering group before, um, ju just as a participant completing the questionnaire. So for me, it's interesting to see how, you know, to be involved in that, that step further, if you like. But I've also been involved in... Um, uh, well, obviously applying for research grants, but also being on committees and chairing committees that award research grants. And so um, I can see how the, the work of the, the priority setting exercises would, would feed into that type of work as well. And it does, it does have a positive influence. I think the only thing I would add is that I have experience with ME Action UK. Uh, with organising millions of missing events over the past few years, but also doing lots more in between then uh, to keep ME Action UK going. And uh, locally, I'm uh, involved in the Sheffield ME and Fibromyalgia group. Uh, and then more recently, I'm also involved in Decode Me uh, on patient public involvement steering group for that. So I think that kind of gives me a broad range of experience and 
input from people with ME uh, and others kind of across the board that, that adds to what I can I can give to the priority setting partnerships there in group. So my hopes for this project ultimately are that some really interesting and important research questions are identified and most importantly are funded. And I think the fact that the Medical Research Council is one of the funders of this PSP and the PSP is part of a very well respected process that the James Lind Alliance has, has run with other illnesses and conditions. I think one of the exciting things about this project is the sort of cross-border collaboration with funders from Scotland and from England and UK wide and along with the other um, funders and supporters we've mentioned is the Scottish Government's Chief Scientist Office and I think it's fantastic that they're involved as well. If we do this really meticulously and we get great involvement from the ME community it will boil down to some really important research being done. And ultimately, obviously, I hope that leads to people becoming well or becoming more well or, you know, getting more of their lives back, essentially. So that's it. That's what it's about for me. So my hopes for the project overall um, is to really engage people living with the condition, whether that's people with ME, their carers, their parents, um, and find out what they, and professionals caring for people with ME very importantly as well, um, because to find out what they want to know, um, what they think they need, what they think they want to find out about to help them uh, with the condition to help them improve. And once we've established um, the research priorities to then use the clout of those supporting the, the um, process, um, those involved with the process to, as I said, engage new researchers, uh, engage existing re researchers in the areas um, as to the areas that need to that really need to be explored and the areas that really matter to improve the lives of people with this condition, people caring for people with this condition as well. Um, hopefully lead to funding, raise the profile, and ultimately improve um, improve the lives of people, um, people with ME, um, those looking after them uh, and those caring for them as well. Well, I absolutely agree. It's, it's what people with ME and their carers and what their research, um, the clinicians, it's the priority is to look at what people on the ground want in research. Um, obviously, because I take a drug, I have an interest in clinical drug trials and I, I don't hide that. Um, but if you look at the system, uh, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, will only um, say that a drug, um, recommend a drug for treatment if it's gone through clinical trials. Now, there's actually quite a few drugs that we think might help people. There's treatments for orthostat orthostatic intolerance. You know, people have problems sleeping. What helps them? They low dose antidepressants may help some people. There's the people with severe ME, the amount of pain they have, you know, what's the best painkiller? And all those kind of issues are very obvious. And in any other condition, we'd have already had research, we'd have had clinical trials looking at it. But the problem is the funding is, is so scarce for ME. Um, if you think of cancer research, there's thousands times more money in cancer research than in ME research. And so our only way forward is through the government funding, the MRC, the NIHR. And in order to do that, the patient voices saying, this is really important to us, actually might make a difference. I think it gives, if you like, a formal, very thorough process and a, a formal label, if you like, for patients' voices or 
I'm not sure what the official term is because I don't like the term sufferers, although we do suffer. Um, but it, it gives a, a formal process and label and a very sound and robust methodology to um, to patients' voices. So it, it gives it that clout and credibility, if you like. And I think it's a really important way in which the people who have ME and the people who are caring for them can make their views coherently held and brought together. I mean, there's a huge range like all these things, but there's, there's such a huge range of ways in which ME um, affects people. Uh, and there's consequently lots of different voices and views and opinions. And I, and I think something that can, can give, if you like, an overall, an overview of what's, what's um, affecting most, what's the big issues for most of the people most of the time does help to focus what's, what's most important. And uh, the PSB has got links with all the major uh, UK ME charities and organisations and everybody's working very collaboratively to get the message out to all their members via social media, via their magazines, via their websites and so on. So there's a fantastic level of collaboration there. The, the link to the survey will be on the um, PSP website and the, and you'll be seeing that link coming up in the screen and also in the description that follows this film and there will be special provision made for people with very severe ME who um, will be able to have their answer be able to give their answers over the telephone and for those to be captured um, in the survey and there will also be paper copies available so a lot of thought has gone into trying to make this process as inclusive as inclusive as possible. And all that information is on the PSP website, it explains very clearly how, how you can get involved. We have worked quite hard to try and make the survey easily readable for people with ME, um, uh, use language that's kind of appropriate and accessible. Um, and where possible, keep that language minimum so that we're not asking people to read more than they need to. So we've separated out uh, more information into FAQs so that people who need, who want to need that more information can access it, but it's not necessary for everyone to read it. Um, we're also making the survey available uh, by, uh, as a paper questionnaire that can be posted out to people and they can fill in at their own time. The survey itself will be available for at least two months and possibly three. Um, which will give people, uh, you know, a significant amount of time to fill it in. Um, and then finally, we're, we're hoping to work with the 25% ME group themselves to enable people who are kind of very severely ill uh, to uh, send in their questions about research by text or email or other, other methods that work for that individual person. Uh, and, and we will have more information about that, hopefully by the time this video airs. I think so. Um, I think, you know, the, there will be groups that are maybe not affiliated in with any of the major charities. If anyone is watching this and hasn't heard of this by any other means, you know, firstly, they should do the survey, but secondly, they can pass it on to their surveys, to their, to their contacts. Um, you can download posters, you can send it to your local health centre, um, you can tweet it, Instagram, Facebook, you know, there's lots of publicity that everyone can do that will pass it on into the ME community. Um, it, there's even a letter on the website going to, that you can just copy and paste that you can send to a local newspaper. We've tried to make it really as easy as possible to spread publicity. Yes, so this survey is the first step in the process because it's casting a really wide net and it's really finding out the breadth of issues that people want to know more about um, with NE. And then from that, the James Lind Alliance will help with the process of seeing have any of those questions already been substantially answered by research? 
And if th they already have, then they're not things that need to be investigated further. So it's a sort of sifting process. And this sifting process will lead to a long list of questions. And then that's where the steering group and in discussion will look at how do we how do we narrow that how do we narrow that uh, long list of questions down to a shorter list and then from there the remaining part of the process is is yet to be finalized because it depends what comes back from this first stage but there will be workshops and there'll be further, further discussions sort of looking at the top 25 to 30 questions that come up and then narrowing them down, working together on what is the final priority area and um, priority order, sorry, for the question. So it's sort of a, a wide funnel sort of narrowing down, narrowing down until there's consensus and arrived at what are the really, really crucial uh, smaller number of questions that need to be addressed by research. I will do a little plug for the PSP website. So if you head over to www psp-me.co.uk you will find uh, all sorts of things uh, to get uh, all sorts of ways to get involved including taking the first survey uh, which is the, the most important thing at this stage but lots of ways to help us spread the word too uh, and yeah the more people we can get involved the, the greater legitimacy this will have at the end in terms of going to research funders and saying that this is, this is really important this is what yeah. needs to be and let's let's get let's get on with this. Let's make a difference to people with ME.